my name is Louis Pellegrino and I am in fifth grade. This year I studied flying creatures of the fifth day. This is the launch machine I made to launch the paper airplanes I built at three different angles. 15, 30, and 45. So the first thing I did to um, <clears throat> to make the plane launch was I put the rubber band on the two screws. I pulled the rubber band back to here, both pieces of it. Then I put the paper clip on the front of the paper airplane on the rubber band. Then I pulled the trigger, which shoots it like that. Isaac Newton discovered gravity and created three laws of motion. Newton brilliantly revealed that gravity is a force which pulls things to the center of the earth. Additionally, he realizes that all objects follow the three laws of motion. The purpose of my experiment is to test the effect of launch angles on gliding and to demonstrate Newton's first law of inertia. This law states that an object in motion will stay in motion until acted upon by another force. Gliding is essentially the act of moving forwards while falling. Once the projectile is launched, gravity is the only force acting on the projectile. Gravity affects the vertical motion of an object, causing it to move in a parabolic path. For this project, I asked myself the question, does the launch angle affect the distance an object will glide? I learned that many creatures in the animal kingdom glide to evade predators. Some, like the flying squirrel and Draco lizard, use an increased jump height to gain greater distance. The flying fish must use a launch angle. To test my question, I will be using a paper airplane to simulate the action of the flying fish. I will launch my paper airplane at a 15 degree angle, 30 degree angle, and 45 degree angle. My hypothesis is that the paper airplane launch at a 45 degree angle will glide the farthest distance. Having created a launch device, the force exerted on the paper airplane by the device's rubber band is my control variable. This force will be constant throughout the experiment. My independent variable will be the launch angle. My dependent variable will be the glide distance. All trials will be performed indoors to eliminate the effect of other forces acting on my projectile, such as wind. My hypothesis was not supported. The paper airplane launched at the 30 degree angle glided the farthest distance. I determined that when the plane was launched at the highest angle, the speed decreased while ascending. As, as a result of the speed decrease, the force of gravity was able to more quickly overcome the launch force. This perfectly demonstrates Newton's first law, which states that an object in motion will stay in motion until acted upon. While testing the smallest angle, I realized that although the paper airplane was able to maintain its launch speed, the force of gravity had a shorter height which to pull the plane down. The 30 degree angle is the perfect combination of acceleration and height. Is that me really to cook and pick your upper? Hi, my name is Nichelle Jean and I'm in third grade. And today I'm, I'd like to tell you about my science for project. Is bounty really the quicker picker upper? So our question is, which paper towel is the most absorbent if I test great value, sparkle, and bounty? So, if I 
touch the observancy of great value, sparkle, and bounty, I think bounty will be the most absorbent because, because they advertise as the quicker picker upper. If you'd like to do this experiment for yourself at home, here are the material materials you're going to need. You're going to need great value, sparkle, and bounty paper towels. You're going to need a measuring cup or a pitcher, water, a graduated cylinder, stopwatch, sharpie, scissors, and food coloring. Now let's go over here to our procedure. You want to cut the paper towel to the same size. Fill a measuring cup up with water, add food coloring to the water so, the so it will be easier to see. Fill the graduated cylinder with 70 milliliters of water. Roll your great value paper towel into a cylinder. Place the end of the paper towel to, towel to the 50 milliliter mark. Hold the paper towel in the water for 20 seconds. Pull the paper towel out of the water and allow water to drip back for 10 seconds. Record how much water was left in the graduated cylinder. Subtract step 9 from the 70 milliliters to calculate how much water was absorbed by the paper towel. Repeat the test four more times for the Great Valley paper towel and you total five tests. Repeat the test on sparkle and bounty. And I will demonstrate it for you. So you want to make sure your paper towel is rolled up into a cylinder like this. So then you want to put it down to the 50, so you want to fill up your water and then, you want, and then put your paper towel down to the 50 milliliter mark and you would, in real, and when you do this te test, you will want to hold it in for 20 seconds, but to show you, I'm only gonna hold, I'm not gonna hold it in for that long. And we're gonna let it drip down for about five. And then you can see it absorbed about uh, 62 milliliters of water. So now let's go to our results. So in test one of great value, we have uh, for great value we had three. In test two, for great value we had two point five. In test three, three milliliters. In test four, five. In test in fact test five we had three. So let's go to sparkle now. In test one there were three milliliters of water. Test two three. Test three test three three. Test four three. Test five test. Four, Five, three. And then for bounty, test one was six, test two was seven, test three was eight, test four was six, test five was was six point five. So in conclusion, bounty paper towels absorb an average of six point seven milliliters of water. Great value absorbed an average of three point three milliliters of water. Sparkle absorbed an average of three milliliters of water. Bound paper towels were t over two times more absorbent than sparkle and great value. My hypothesis was supported. Now let's go to some of our observations. So, all of the paper towels are two ply. Bounty has the roughest texture. Bounty also feels the thickest. Sparkle feels the thinnest, and great value is the softest. This concludes my presentation. Bye, have a great day. Hi, my name is Ashley. Hi, my name is Brandon. Our question yes. is, can, can you retrain your brain to read upside down? A year ago, I was diagnosed with dyslexia. My mom bought this big book, and she read it. She, we heard a lot about retraining your brain and rewiring your brain. So we looked farther into it and we learned about the word neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is how the brain can adapt and change based on experience. Have you ever heard the saying, practice makes perfect? So the way it works is, messages from your brain travel through many nerve cells. As they hop from one nerve cell to the next, the neurotransmitters are there to help. Because without them, the messages couldn't travel because they wouldn't be able to connect. Scientists have found that the more messages travel through the same nerve cells, the thicker they become.
They've discovered it's not the axon that's getting thicker, it's the myelin sheath that's wrapping around it. You can compare this to a rocky road and a really fast highway. So at first, it's like the rocky road. It's very slow and inefficient. But the more you do the same things, the thicker those connections become, which moves you onto like a fast highway where you're going triple times the speed. That's pretty much what the myelin sheath does. The more you use the same connections, the thicker it wraps around the axon, which makes it way more efficient. And that's why practice actually does make perfect. According to the book, this is what a brain looks like when they're reading. A non-dyslexic and a dyslexic. Non-dyslexic, you can see, uses three parts that have all been activated. A dyslexic only uses one. The other two have not been activated. The one that a dyslexic uses is being way overused. It's important for a person with dyslexia to know their brain is just wired differently. And when they have a tutor that can help them activate those areas, they will get better at reading and they'll be more confident. And that's why we chose this project, because we thought that if you can retrain your brain to activate reading parts in your brain, you can probably retrain it to read upside down. Our hypothesis is that if you were to read upside down and practice, you'd get better and faster. So here's how we did our experiment. We had our friends, our family, and anyone who was willing to be a test subject for us. We had them read upside down on the best vacation ever, a grade five level reading sheet for one minute. Then we wrote how many words per minute they got on our special chart. And we instructed them to read upside down each day for a week. And then the next week we brought them all back and tested them on upside down on a new reading sheet called Jump Around. Then we wrote how many words per minute they got and then we put it on a bar graph and compared the two. We split our results into three categories. Kids, teachers, adults. The light pink is the first test that we tested them on and the dark pink is the second test we tested them on. Our analysis is we noticed that every single test subject improved Age didn't really make a difference, as you can see from the adult and kids charts. We noticed that teachers scored higher because they're used to working in an environment where they are constantly reading upside down. We also noticed that the people who practiced less days didn't improve as much as the people who practiced more days. We also asked all the people in our test subjects if they found it easier as the week progressed. By the third day, they all said that it felt easier and they could read faster. It shows practice does make perfect. Our controlled variables were all our test subjects were grade five or higher. Both reading passages were grade five and they all got the same instructions. Our uncontrollable variables were how long each person practiced, what level of reading, the font can also make a difference, and we also couldn't control how many days they practiced. I mean, we told them to practice for every day. Some people are just pretty busy. Our conclusion shows that yes, you can retrain your brain to read upside down. This shows that people can learn new things and make new connections at all ages because cells that fire together, wire together. And if you don't use it, you'll lose it. Thanks for watching our video. Bye.